Hi, this is Jerry Boyer. Welcome back to Meeting of Minds with Jerry Boyer. Today, our guest is Rob Arnott. He's the founder of Research Affiliates, um, which advises something north, I think, of $150 billion. Um, Rob is um, uh, extremely influential, gigantic intellect in the area of uh, financial economics um, in that he is on the investment management side of things, certainly, but he's also written somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 published academic papers and several books and is certainly very much someone who's engaged with not just managing money, but thinking about the theory of finance and interest rates um, and the factors that drive investment returns. And by the way, also thinks a whole lot about economics, finance and politics as well. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right, we might loop back to this later, but let's kind of assume a certain kind of base case economically um, over the kind of investable horizon, which is, let's start with a political base case. Both parties have surrendered on fiscal restraint. Yeah, Both par- Both parties have surrendered on soundness of money. Um, I, I mean, the other, each party might criticize the inflation when the other party's in charge, but in essence, right. when we're in charge, keep the printing press going. Um, yeah. We have, an, we're shifting towards an anti-growth environment, so we're likely to have growing deficits, growing national debt, growing monetization, and uh, mm. tepid economic growth. So that's a scenario that we, we don't know the future, but that's a scenario that seems plausible to you and maybe even base case most probable out of the possible scenarios. Is that right? I'd say it's fast becoming a base case. The whole notion that um, <clears throat> the core purpose of money is as a medium of exchange. Uh, uh, if I want something from you, uh, do I trade you stock market advice in exchange for a uh, podcast. Uh, I don't think that works very well. Um, but to ex- to receive uh, money in exchange for my efforts and pay for your efforts or someone else's efforts, that's the core purpose of money. It's both cross-sectional and intertemporal temporal, uh, transfer of effort from one person to another. That's the core purpose. From that perspective, so cross-sectional, we, we exchange with one another now. An right. intertemporal is it holds its value for the future, so it can be a exactly. store of value. Yes, okay, exactly. So if um, oh, it's kind of interesting. The difference between two percent and three percent inflation is: do you want the dollar to be worth thirteen cents or or seven cents a hundred years from now? Uh, <laughs> it's splitting hairs. It is. Um, it would be nice if the dollar's worth a dollar. Uh, it, it's interesting. The Byz- Byzantine Empire had 600 years in which the Byzant had stable purchasing power for 600 years. 660. Until they got um, an emperor who decided to uh, confiscate all of the currency, re- re-stamp it as being worth twice its value and reissue it, thereby um, doubling his money. Um, but for 600 years, we, we worry about how do we keep inflation under control over the next five or 10 years? You can keep it under control for hundreds of years if you're determined to respect the store of value aspect of money. Hmm. So... In your view, um, money is, you went right to money as our topic of conversation because we talked yeah. about macroeconomics in general. I'm interpreting that to mean that you're thinking of money as maybe the central question right now. Inflation I think it is. Money. Yeah. I think it is. Um, so uh, I think Keynes, as brilliant as he was uh, and as right as he was about many things, uh, was wrong about money. And it's interesting, even Keynes thought um, you run surpluses during the good times so that you can afford to run deficits during the bad time. And inflation is the enemy of everyone. Uh, Those are out the window. So people talk like, uh, claim to be Keynesians. No, the neo-Keynesians have a radically different worldview in which inflation is desirable 
um, and in which deficit spending through thick or thin is the right way to do things. It's, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, my core political principles are really simple. It's uh, personal liberty, economic freedom, uh, respect for the constitution and limited government. Hmm. For 2020, I don't know which party showed any respect for any of the four. No, and, and even the movement to some degree, when, when Trump was president, um, and the Fed, you know, allowed just the tiniest increase of interest rates. They just took the, you know, the dead weight of financial suppression off just a bit. Um, mm-hmm. And markets had their taper tantrums, et cetera. A shocking number of conservative institutions and leaders came forward to say, oh, the president's right. Um, you know, with this, we're in a deflationary environment um, and, and, and people in Congress, et cetera, and commentators. So if the tribalism is even outside of those who are in the White House and in Congress and even out into the opinion molding institutions, then it seems to me yeah. there's a vanishingly small constituency for sound money out there. And if that's the case, we're even less likely to have sound money. Yeah. Yeah. And part of it is uh, who do you prefer? because we can't wave a magic wand and have as president um, somebody that's exactly uh, what we want. Ron Paul. Uh, And so last summer I was asked at a couple of conferences, um, uh, what do you think about um, the election? And my, my response was, well, you have a choice between a person who I think gets a B for policy. I think that B went all the way down to a D by the end of his term. But last summer, I think it was still a B, B for policy and an F for style. And I think you have a choice between that and somebody who will have an F for policy and a B for style. Now, which do you want? Right. And uh, the reality is that Biden's been anywhere, anywhere, nowhere near a B for style. No, no, no. So so it's, 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 um, who do you want? It's, um, uh, I think 2024, we have a chance to get somebody principled. And wouldn't that be nice? Well, let's say that we're heading for a time of relatively low economic growth um, and relatively high inflation. Yes. You know, kind of a base case, but not a lock. Well, we had that in the 70s. Um, we did. Yeah. So if we have something like that again, it's almost like history, in my view, providence calls forth solutions through our errors. That era created Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan. Right. So, so if we go through an era like that again, might it not call forward? In some sense, in some sense, um, Trump had a kind of a Nixonian quality. Um, yeah. Uh, in in personality, but also in policy, Nixon was kind yes. of a easy money guy and an economic nationalist. Um, so if we had a Nixonian and then we're followed by a Cartarian, <laughs> will we get a Kempian or a Reaganite as kind of the next, you know, the next move of the Republican Party? Well, it it, it would be uh, wonderful if that happens. Keep in mind that um, um, a society has to be prosperous to fall prey to um, things like wokeism and socialism. Uh, you don't have time for that stuff if you're worried about where your next meal is or where, where you're going to have a roof over your head. Um, so prosperity is needed before you can start to lean socialist and before you can start to get obsessed about wokeism. Um, and the result of that is that when they take root it often takes quite a while to get people angry enough to throw off those shackles. Uh, um, Lenin came along in 1917 and uh, Soviet Union disintegrated in 1989-90. All right, that's a long time. Uh, Argentina uh, has had bouts of, of this going back generations and and brief interludes of common sense. Uh, Venezuela has been under the thumb of um, uh, Chavez and Maduro for um, going on 25 years at this point. Hmm. So uh, my, my fear is that we go through a dark period that lasts a while before people really truly wake up. But uh, I hope I'm wrong. Um, It would be 
nice if um, some party leader, um, either party, wouldn't matter to me, came along and said, uh, you know, I believe in personal liberty. I believe in economic freedom, uh, the right to make our own economic choices. Um, I believe in limited government, not likely from a Democrat, but uh, <laughs> um, but let's let's make it real. Let's not just give it lip service. And I believe in the respect for the Constitution. Now, in all likelihood, um, Republican Party gives lip service to these things. But as we saw last year and this year, um, absolutely no commitment to any of the four. Okay, so let's integrate that with an investment outlook. I mean, one of the challenges is when you have something like massive risk like that, a risk of a stagflation or even some kind of economic or financial or dollar collapse or a currency collapse. And you know, one of the problems is our crowd, you know, pe Austrian uh, types, um, have had a lot of false positives on, yes, on the great collapse. Uh, uh, so, you know, 2008, 2009, I had to talk a lot, uh, 2010, I had to talk a lot of clients off the ledge. They mm -hmm. watched us, they watched some Glenn Beck or, you know, something like that. And they thought, this is it, dollar collapse. Okay, so, uh, so there've been a lot of false positives, but that doesn't mean it never happens. And it's kind of right. hard to integrate that kind of outlook with, rules-based investing, you know, and that's your zone. That's my zone as well. It happens to be what's called smart beta. You yeah. develop rules and then the portfolio follows the rules. So smart beta is pointing you in a certain direction. You can talk about what that is in terms of value and cap size and also location, domicile, country, important. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so where you would be if you didn't have this particular concern economically right. and and then you know d does that environment help or hurt your basic investment premise there's a lot of misconceptions out there about the linkage between the economy and the uh capital markets uh, that linkage is more tenuous than most people think the linkage between politics and markets is actually stronger than most people think uh, but not in the way that they think. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? Let's suppose you have a choice between a uh, hardcore socialist government that wants to print money, uh, redistribute wealth, um, and uh, prop up uh, favorite enterprises and so forth. Let's suppose on the other side you have a... Um, uh, strident libertarian who says, I don't want us to control the game. I want the game to run itself. Um, which is going to be better for the stock market? I mean, it's self-evident who's going to be better for the long-term growth of the economy. That's obvious. But for the stock market, you, you pour fiscal stimulus into the economy. There's almost a dollar for dollar link between deficit spending and earnings uh, growth over the next four years. If you spend a trillion you don't have, um, corporate earnings go up about a quarter trillion a year for four years. Um, that's not widely understood. If you have monetary stimulus, it makes its way into the macro economy by way of the financial services sector. Mm -hmm. So it's massively beneficial to the financial services sector and through that to other corporations. Now, um, it doesn't sustain itself. That's the problem. It props up the markets in a very self-evident and very vigorous way. Can keep valuations artificially high longer. Correct. Up, right. yes. Now, let's suppose a libertarian comes along and says, enough of this nonsense. We're going to let the markets make their own decisions, let businesses make their own decisions. We're going to enforce antitrust and enforce laws that relate to not deliberately harming one another and not uh, deliberately lobbying the government to get special treatment for your business. But uh, as long as you want to compete fairly and ethically and honorably, do whatever you want, grow however you like, create whatever products you like, as long as you're not inflicting harm. Uh, what's that going to do to share values? 
Well, the growth in the economy consists of growth in existing enterprises and the creation of new enterprises. If new enterprise creation suddenly takes off, you're going to wind up with um, uh, higher interest rates, robust economic growth. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that existing enterprises are going to grow any faster. Now, the other side of the coin, yeah, they might lose market share. To these, they're to losing these. market share in a very healthy way, right. um, and and there's uh, dilution too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. There's yeah, a dilution and, effect. And yeah. even more to the point, um, if entrepreneurial capitalism is suddenly going taking off, people will expect higher returns from their existing investments in order to justify hanging on to those investments. Well, higher returns means lower prices. Right. Right. There's a hurdle rate. There's an expectation right. for a hurdle rate, so which kind of act, rate acts, like a acts like a discount rate to some degree and hurts the, if the yeah. hurdle rate soars. If the yeah. discount rate soars, then the price goes down. Right. Um, so what is good for the economy near term and long term uh, is not necessarily good for the stock market short term. And none of us should really care about short term because ultimately, are we going to spend the money next year or are we going to spend it in 20 years? And is that arguably differential between a passive index investor and someone who's sp sp spreading out capital, however, equal weight, value weight, whatever, mm -hmm. that there's, there's in essence the protection of the incumbent um, is something that, that will affect value, excuse me, that will affect cap weighted investors, passive right. investors more than it will everybody else. I, I think there's an, um, an element of truth to that. If you have a um, uh, control economy, those closest to the corridors of power, which would be the largest companies, um, will be able to lobby to squelch their um, upstart competition. And so that can be good for their valuations. Um, the nuance with indexing, though, the more important nuance is membership in the index versus non-membership. And, mm. and basically what you find is that being in an index is worth 10 to 20 percentage points of relative price um, uh, just by dint of being in the index. Relative uh, price or relative valuation or both? Both, okay. both. Uh, that is to say, a stock that is a member of the S and P will trade ten to twenty percent higher than an identical stock that's not. So you join the S and P, um, and your normal valuate your normal PE isn't twenty; it's twenty-five or something like that. That's exactly right. right. And so what you're looking sorry. at, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what you're looking at is is that um, uh, it's an ownership effect. We've written about this quite a bit with regard to Tesla, which was, of course, the largest addition to the S and P in its history. And being the largest, it came in at number six, six out of five hundred. So. Um, my goodness, coming in at that level required um, on the order of $150 billion, about a fourth of the open, of the outstanding stock of Tesla to be bought. Uh, most index funds will buy it at the close on the effective date because they don't want to be tagged with having any tracking error at all with the published index. So when the index says uh, 4 p.m. on the... Um, uh, I believe it was the 18th of December is the price at which it joins and it joins effective that the next Monday morning, but at that price. Okay. Then you want to trade at that price and you can, it's, it's a, an order on close where you simply say market on close order uh, for um, uh, 50 million shares and it will happen at that closing price. Hmm. So that's their way to avoid tracking error. But what happened to Tesla between early in the year, it was first speculated in March that if the first quarter came in in the black, uh, Tesla would now imminently qualify for the S&P. So now's the time to buy it. And um, sure enough, between March and December in just nine months, it, it rose 800%. Hmm. Uh, now, was that 800% because sales were exceeding expectations? No, it was 800% because the stock was joining the S&P. Yes. 
Um, so not 20%. That's interesting. Right. So, so is there something there where the S&P is like, I'm legitimizing you? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you smoke pot, you're a little crazy, right? So the legitimizing is very real. And, and really the narrative was um, uh, index funds have to buy an enormous amount of this in one day. Uh, why don't we be the owners and sell it to them? And of course, hedge funds have been playing that game for 30 years, um, providing liquidity to the index funds. And they did again this time. Uh, AIV, uh, the apartment investment um, uh, company that um, basically was an REIT invested in apartment buildings, mm -hmm. was dropped from the index. And uh, it's it's up over 40% since it was added. So it was pushed down by knowledge that 25% of its stock was going to be sold in one day. Oh, I see. So it's, you, uh, you sell on the rumor, buy on the reality, right? Exactly. Like the, the REIT was put on sale on the rumor that it was going to be dropped. Right. 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 And, and by the way, that seems pretty counterintuitive to me to be dropping REITs during a time of, you know, inflation, probable inflation, because, you know, real estate's at least a decent inflation hedge. But that, well, it was a company that was tiny in market cap. Um, it ranked in the bottom 20 in the S&P 500. It had performed badly as a business. It had struggled. Um, it was had been losing money. And basically, the way the S&P Investment Committee works is anything that they're embarrassed that isn't in the index, eventually they're going to put it in the index. Mm -hmm. Anything that they're embarrassed that it's still in the index, eventually they're going to take it out. And so this was a pristine example of both. But the reason for the big move um, in both cases was the size of the company coming aboard. We find that going back historically, a stock that's added, they pre-announce, might be a week, it might be three weeks, but they pre-announce and say, as of thus and such date, this is coming into the index and that's going out. Now, that's really just a favor for the index funds because the index funds don't want to get tagged with moving the share price with their purchase or sale. So they let somebody else move the price and then they transact with the hedge funds that have already moved the price I see. and they transact at the price at which the stock is added or dropped. So that way they get rid of all tracking here. Now, um, what's interesting is if a stock is added, that's in the, in the, um, a stock that's added normally rises roughly 10 percentage points between the date of the announcement and the effective date. 10 percentage points relative to the market. If the market's going up or down, it, it's on top of that. Stocks that are dropped lose 6 or 8% percent, um, during that same span. And so there's this enormous spread between the two. Now, what's interesting is what happens afterwards. There's a little follow through on day one because some indexes didn't quite finish their purchases. So they push it up a little more and they push down the deletion a little more. But after that first day, the uh, deletions on average outperform by 20 percentage points, 2,000 hmm. basis points in the next year. Interesting. And the, the additions underperform by about 2%. So does next. that does that suggest a kind of a rotation in terms of strategies away from large cap sure. growth towards an awareness that, hey, man, you need some earnings per, year, per, per the dollar you spend. In other words, you didn't get the normal exactly. reaction to delisting. And doesn't what you're saying kind of pushes uh, me towards the mid, small and mid cap, wherever you want to say 10 billion market cap and under or something like that, that makes that whole zone look, it kind of explains why that zone tends to be on sale compared to large cap. Right. And maybe I'm more attractive now because it had gotten very strong and differential in terms of valuation. And now you've got a momentum shift, a shift in the narrative, a shift in the mindset, which makes that even more compelling a proposition. I, am, I, am I putting words in your mouth or is that? Uh, um, that well, thinking? that's that's a thesis that um, loosely relates to what I was talking about, but it's one that has merit. Now, I'd add a nuance to that, and that is um, relative valuation matters. So when small and mid cap are trading at a premium to large cap, um, 
you're probably not going to get out performance. Right. It usually trades at a discount when it's trading at a little bit of a discount. It's probably going to do fine when it's trading at a big discount. That's wonderful. Load up. But so many people invest with their eyes in the rearview mirror. Value underperformed horrifically from 2000, um, uh, 2013, 2012 to 2020. Don't I know um, it? <laughs> I helped. Yeah. I helped design a couple of funds that are value and smid. Yeah, um, and there were some painful years there. There sure were, yeah. and uh, just fell off a cliff from 2018 to 20. Right. So um, value always trades cheaper than growth by definition. Right. Um, but if it's a small spread, then value might actually be very fully priced relative to its diminished growth opportunities because value companies are worse companies. They have um, weaker market share, they have weaker profit margins, they have less growth. And so, of course, they should have a discount relative to the growth stocks, which have great products, great product delivery, and so forth. But the key question is, what is the market already aware of and what's already in the price? That differential between growth and value is almost always already in the price. If value is trading at a modest discount, it's probably too small a discount. It should be cheaper. Yes. If it's trading at an extreme discount, as was the case in 2000 and as was the case in 2020, it's a fantastic time to load up on value. And yet that was at a time when lots of people were arguing that value is dead. Value is dead. And did, around that time, didn't you do an article? The, the death I of wrote that? an article in the Financial Analyst Journal in the first quarter 2021 edition uh, uh, entitled Reports of Value's Death Have Been Greatly Exaggerated. It's kind of a borrowing from Mark Twain's famous comment. Uh, he arrived in San Francisco for a series of lectures only to see the newspaper reporting his death. And so he opened to his diminished audience, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. In any event. Um, well, that's a good uh, timing for an article because uh, value has really knocked the cover off the ball. It really date. is. Yeah. And, and I think it has a long way to run before it's fully priced. The spread, if you look at classic Fama French definition of value, which is price you take 30% of the markets that's cheapest on price to book value, that's value. 30% that's richest, that's growth. Track the difference in performance between the two. Well, you can also track the relative valuation between the two. And that relative valuation on average is five to one. That is to say growth sports a price to book value five times that of the value portfolio. That's an impressive spread, but that's the norm. If it gets to four to one, like it did in 2007, value is probably very fully priced mm -hmm. and you shouldn't expect much from it. And lo and behold, that was the start of the drawdown. At the peak of the tech bubble, growth got, got to a 10 to 1 multiple relative to value. In August of 2020, it got to a 13 to 1 ratio hmm. relative to value, 30% richer relative to value than it was at the peak of the tech bubble. And so what a wonderful time to say, let's boost our allocation to value. But of course, people invest with their eye in the rearview mirror. What's, what's newly cheap got there by inflicting pain and losses. And human nature is, I don't want pain. I don't want losses. If it's inflicted pain and losses, get me out of here. Yes. And Yeah, there's a, almost a Pavlovian thing. The lizard exactly. brain is in charge here, right? The presumption is past as prologue. If it's hurt me before, it's going to hurt me again. Right. And if it's been a big winner before, it's going to be a big winner again. Well, that's not just not true. Past is not prologue. Whatever is newly extravagantly expensive got there by creating joy and profit. People want more of that, so they're reluctant to sell. Hmm. So it goes completely against human nature to buy value when it's extraordinarily cheap, uh, which it was last summer, and it's still impressively cheap. Um, not off the charts, but, but way outside of historic norms. Yeah, what, what, like maybe 95th, 96th percentile or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So two standard deviations in that in that neighborhood. So still compelling. And the story's changed. So the narrative is shifting. So there's a momentum shift. So that's also compelling. That, that, All right, right. So let's bring that back 
with your economic and political outlook. So is that still compelling if you have this conflation between big tech keeping out the little guys and easy money keeping valuations high? Does that still work Um, uh, or does it work less? Um, For the patient long-term investor, it works. Uh, Crony capitalism can throw a monkey wrench into things. It never helps long-term valuations, but it can help short-term valuations. Uh, But isn't it interesting that we all tend to invest with um, blinders on? We focus on domestic stocks, domestic bonds, and there's a world international now. Yes. So international stocks, um, uh, there's an index called EFA, uh, Europe, Asia, Far East. Um, uh, excuse me, Europe, Australia, Far East. Um, uh, and that index is priced about 40% cheaper than U.S. stocks. So people say low interest rates are propelling stocks higher. Okay, Europe and Japan have zero to negative interest rates. Why are they at a 40% discount relative to the U.S.? Then you have emerging markets where the narrative is um, uh, this COVID mess is going to undermine their supply chains for years to come. Uh, they haven't remotely got a handle on it. They have their rollout of vaccines is terribly slow. And so watch out. This is not going to be a great environment for emerging markets. Um, the time to buy is when pessimism is, is at its peak. Temple. Emerging markets are 60% off relative to U.S. stocks. And emerging markets value is cheap. So the so, narrative is is driving the investment allocation internationally it as opposed to the numbers, as opposed to the analysis. Yeah. yeah. Narratives always drive market behavior. And the reason that they're so persuasive is that they're, they're true. The narratives are true. The question is, are the narratives unknown to the market? And is the market already fully discounted or over discounted the narrative? Right. So when the narrative becomes exceptionally bleak, just look at the market and ask, has the market responded to this news? And is, is the market more than amply discounting these worst case scenarios that everyone's talking about? If, if United Mark Kingdom and Brexit worst would case be scenarios buy United Kingdom, Brexit would be sort of an example yeah. of that where the yeah. story just gets so apocalyptic. That it creates. Last fall, we talked about UK value stocks as a bargain of the decade because um, the UK was priced at about 60% discount to the US Mm -hmm. and their value stocks were half off again. So I've been called a perma bear, but I'm bearish on things that are very fully priced, not because I think they're imminently going to go down, but because I just don't want to play that game of picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Um, I want to find something that's cheap where the patient investor can make serious money. And there's almost always something out there that is. So we were talking about the economic outlook. Let's say we have a stagflationary period and how that might not help stocks here. It might not even differentially help um, small cap and value. You might have to wait that out. Okay. But then, so that might be a little bit of a headwind over the short run for the SMID value proposition, maybe. Um, on the other hand, sometimes bad economics is also bad for markets. It's not always the case that, you know, the, um, and so there but can the be- the starting ex- point is a market as expensive as this one, Precisely. that is likely to be bad. That's it, right, so that's a concern. So then you look out cross-sectionally, which people, there's, talk about blinders. The home bias, um, among investors is amazing. It's, it's shocking how much people think of being 100% in United States equities as not concentration, not risky base case scenario and having maybe 20 or 30% spread out throughout the rest, the whole rest of the human race yeah. sounds crazy and risky, which I guess is one of the, th- one of the other things that creates that, that value proposition. Right. Um, People should focus on risks that matter, which is overall portfolio volatility and downside risk in real terms, in long-term purchasing power. And they don't. Uh, They focus on, am I up or down? Uh, 
am I up or down relative to my next door neighbor? Yes. If my next door neighbor is up 20% and I'm up 10%, I'm miserable. Um, and Covetousness makes for bad investment decisions. Right. And so what we like to call maverick risk, which is the risk of being different from your peer group, is actually the thing that people fear most. It's not downside risk. It's downside risk relative to the Joneses next door. And this is why um, people are constantly watching the S&P and saying, how am I doing relative to that? Um, it's an almost irrelevant comparison, but it's front and center in most people's minds. Is Maverick risk a bigger risk for the investor or is Maverick risk a bigger risk for the advisor or money manager? Uh, That's a very good question. It's a bigger risk for the advisor or money manager. It's a very big risk for the advisor or money manager. Um, uh, it's not a big risk for the end customer, but it's perceived as a big risk by the end customer, which is why it gets so much attention. And the reality is if you're an investment advisor and you give brilliant advice that works over five and 10 year spans and makes clients lots of money, but has an occasional horrific year or two uh, along the way, if you lose all your clients, you haven't done them any favors by having brilliant long-term ideas. Hmm. Um, and so maverick risk does matter. You do have to pay attention to it. For, for my own personal investments, I have well over half of my net worth in emerging markets value stocks. So, so do I. Okay. That's exactly what my wife, my wife Susan's here. That's exactly where we are, our whole family. <laughs> a, a majority and waiting in, in, in uh, mostly emerging, yeah, overseas, but mostly yeah. emerging, and value, value and quality as well, um, yeah. and some governance characteristic um, screens. So, our, we have an asset allocation interactive website that forecasts returns for 130 different asset classes, and it does it really simply by what's the yield, what's the likely real growth in income, um, what's the likely direction for changes in valuations. And so if the valuations are low, we give it a little bit of added boost for rising valuations. If it's high, we give it a bit of a haircut. And out of that work, we come to a, an expectation that U.S. stocks will give about a 2% return over the next 10 years. That's all. Real or nominal? Nominal. Zero in real terms. Oh, my, my goodness. That, that, that sounds, that sounds quite plausible to me, but that's... I mean, think about the havoc that, re that wreaks oh, in yeah, a society yeah. where so many people are retiring. Exactly. You know, and, and there's so many pension plans. And the retiring is actually probably one of the key drivers that's creating this situation. Um, you've had a cohort of valuation indifferent buyers. They had to invest planning ahead for retirement. They become a cohort of valuation indifferent sellers because they have to sell to buy goods and services in retirement. Um, and that next generation behind the boomers, they're now valuation indifferent buyers, but they're not as wealthy as the boomers. So the, the risk is downward revaluation in the coming 10 years. We don't make that as one of our core assumptions, although I think it is a legitimate one. Uh, we simply assume that current valuations are 34 times the 10 year average earnings for the S&P. Historic norm is 18. Maybe this is a new normal. Maybe it's not. Let's split the difference and go halfway to 26. So your um, your investment proposition of internationalizing, especially with the yep. focus towards EM, seems to me that the economic base case that we've talked about here is a tailwind um, for... I mean, there's a good long-term case, apart from what's going to happen in the next three or four years, to be overweight in emerging value. But Stag in addition- in the U.S. is not bad for emerging markets. Right. It's at the dollar weakens, or you yeah. know, we, we grow at one and a half percent. Even the Congressional Budget Office says we're going to grow at one and a half percent. Well, India's not growing at one and a half percent. India's <laughs> growing at three times that, right? Um, and right. I mean, it has its own risk, but then there's the, the, the seven tigers, et cetera. Um, so that we're, we're debasing our currency faster than EM 
because yeah. they had that terrible experience in the late 90s, so they have a lot of reserves, et cetera. Um, they're growing, they have higher GDP growth, which means they have higher earnings growth. And we've, we're in, entering into an inflationary, you know, bad for the dollar environment. So that to me is two tailwinds behind the EM proposition. That's exactly right. Hmm. Um, and most, most investors across the US and Europe, where most of the money is, um, uh, view emerging markets as kind of dabbling on the fringes, a little risky. Let's not put a lot there. I mean, a 20% allocation to EM would be viewed as reckless. Uh, 5% is more typical. Hmm. Um, now, if you take yourself from zero to five, it's a step in the right direction. And I can't imagine anyone who would have so much aversion to maverick risk that having a 5% toe in the water would should freak them out in any way. But um, um, if you want to get move the needle in a material way, you've got to think in terms of 20, 40 or more. And these markets are not that much riskier than uh, US or European or Japanese stocks measured in any conventional way. The volatility of returns in individual markets, it's high spread across the emerging economies of the world, it's not. Right. Um, emerging markets debt, yes, the volatility is higher than U.S. Treasuries, but hey, the yield is uh, modestly higher than U.S. junk bonds. Yes. Well, that doesn't make sense. U.S. Right. junk bonds have material default risk. Emerging markets bonds, certainly some individual countries might be at risk of defaulting, but the collective investment in emerging markets debt, uh, no. Um, historical default rate is uh, less than 1% per annum. Um, so I look on the opportunities in a broader world market to be pretty good in an environment where the political landscape in the U.S. has become downright scary. You know, looking at this crony capitalism issue, um, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, corrupt politics, you know, might help the incumbents. But what I'm noticing is that um, I, I'm very interested in the issue of what's called woke capitalism, where companies, you know, take political stances and become increasingly almost authoritarian. They ban certain books, they ban certain speech, they jam down the throats of employees, kind of almost Maoist re-education camp diversity training. And, you know, throughout my lifetime, big corporations pretty much only had one decent friend in Washington, that's the Republicans. The Democrats never liked the big corporations. The Republicans had a working relationship. But now these companies are just putting their thumb in the eye of Republican senators, you know, um, and really ticking off half the country. So I'm yeah. wondering, are, they, are some of them, especially the most woke ones, which would be tech, creating so much aversion. The Democrats don't like them because they think they elected Trump through Russian collusion, and the Republicans don't like them because they ban books and ban, ban Twitter accounts, where maybe some of these big tech incumbents are out of political friends, and so crony capitalism doesn't help them. It hurts them. Well, there's also the issue that crony capitalism helps until you, as you suggest, you do irritate somebody. And so people engage in crony capitalism to advance their interests. And then all of a sudden they find themselves um, uh, on the outs. And so it backfires and it backfires badly. Um, I don't think big tech is um, pandering to the left uh, because of an effort to curry favor with Dems. I think they, they pandered to the left because the people running the show there come from the left. <laughs> right. right. Or, or some so, of them have employee groups that are hyper organized and, and conservatives. I've, I've done a little experiment the past two months. I've gone to, I've attended dozens of annual meetings of companies that the indices that I work with, you know, we, that we own shares in um, yeah. to just see how it works and to ask a few questions you know, about excess politicization and boycotting states and all the rest of it. And what yeah. I've learned is almost everyone who shows up is from the hard left. Uh, there's a guy named Justin Danhoff from the Free Enterprise Project who shows up. Um, and I showed up and that made two of us out of hundreds. So yeah. um, I, I, right, I think they're, I don't know, some of them it's convictionally left, some of them it's kowtowing. Whichever it is, it amounts to 
they've lost their only friend. They're losing their only friend on Capitol Hill. So that uh, might make the yeah. proposition for tech companies a little harder to defend. There's, there's a, they're playing a dangerous game for exactly the reason you suggest. Um, uh, the uh, wokeism in corporate America is, um, is disturbing. Um, it's, it's one thing to have political disagreements on any topic you could name. It's quite another to cancel people for views that are seen as um, uh, unacceptable, even if those views are held by a majority of the citizenry or a substantial minority of the citizenry. Right. If you basically say you agree with 40% of the population, you're evil. Um, you're excluded from the dialogue. Uh, then basically you're saying 40% of the population are deplorables. <laughs> yes. And some kind of weird math. You've said that basically two thirds of Americans are extremists. And by what yeah. standard can you define two thirds of the group as extreme? Um, it, it's one of what's, the things what's, what's I the find baseline? fascinating. One of the things I find fascinating is uh, Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, um, uh, where my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The notion that colorblind is racist strikes me as appalling. Um, that suggests to me that Martin Luther King must be have had aspirations for an utterly racist society. Hmm. I don't think so. No. But talking like MLK is ban-worthy in many yeah. places right now in universities. It is. Colorblindness is 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 treated as a form of white supremacy enablement. So I guess my only this is my own pet peeve. I hear conservatives complaining about that a lot. Hey, you know, log on to the annual meeting and speak up, right? Vote you know, put proxies on the ballot, et cetera. I mean, we don't show up. We lost. We didn't lose because we lost. We lost because we forfeited that game. When I don't like what's happening in American politics, I vote. When I don't what, what, like what's happening in corporate politics, I complain on social media. No, I, I'd say yeah. vote. But that's my own. I'm not going to drag you into my thing. Um, so this economic outlook, we're almost out of time, but I, I, I want to get here. There's a kind of a normalness to smart mm -hmm. beta. Right. Um, that it's like we assume that the inflation might be five percent rather than two percent yeah. or whatever. Uh, and that growth um, might be one percent rather than three and a half percent or four. But if we have some kind of threat where there's the possibility of a genuine United States currency crisis or debt crisis, even if it's relatively small, um, doesn't have to be like Venezuela. It can be Greece or Spain or, you know, even like Northern well, Europe. You say right? relatively small. I was thinking exactly that. What do you mean relatively small? It'll be jarring. Yes. Yeah, so, so, e so even like what happened to Northern and mid-European countries during the European debt crisis. So that seems to me to be plausible to me for the United States. Am I, does that seem plausible to you? Absolutely. Okay. So. So what does that a, look like, and how do you prepare for that? Can yeah, smart beta handle that? We might muddle through. Yeah. Um, the markets may make it uh, kick up enough of a hissy fit that um, uh, the um, deficit spending is reined in. The money printing is reined in. That's possible. Um, it's also possible that it continues apace and does serious economic damage, but it's slow, gradual. Um, a friend of mine once wrote a paper um, on boiled frogs that uh, you put frogs into cold water and turn on the burner. They don't know that, know that they're getting cooked until they're cooked. Um, and that boiled frog normalcy of this uh, could put a lot of people to sleep, even as bad, serious damage is done. Or it could be jolting, um, uh, rather like Thelma and Louise, who... Um, were just fine until they hit the edge of the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, no, they were still they were still fine when they hit the edge. It's when they hit the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to, um, to to nitpick the analogy, but so which which do you which do you think is more likely? Boiling frog frog soup or 
Thelma and I, Louise. I think I think there's a decent chance, um, probably, if I had to pick a number, thirty percent chance of uh, serious stagflation, ten uh, percent chance of outlier Spain Greece scenario, hmm. um, uh, thirty percent chance of mild um, stagflation that's enough to do the um, boiled frog scenario. And a 30% chance that we muddle through and that the markets uh, force corrections in behavior that allow us to back away from the edge. Um, on your question of smart beta, smart beta strategies are really designed to give you an alternative way of getting exposure to the markets. The one that we created, Fundamental Index, weights companies based on how big they are in the macro economy instead of how popular they are in the stock market. Hmm. So it's valuation indifferent um, uh, indexing because you're going to own Tesla based on the size of Tesla's business, not yes. the current extravagant expectations for the future. So it'll be in the top hundred. It won't be in the top five. So I'm sorry, is that revenue? Would you call that revenue or sales weighting? It was one of the measures. Uh, cash flow is another. Yeah. Dividends plus stock buybacks is another. Book value adjusted for uh, intangibles is another. And each of the four is a, a, a different perspective on which to gauge the size of the business. So it has a profound value tilt because growth stocks are reweighted way down, value stocks are reweighted way up. But it makes money by contra trading against the market's constantly changing opinions. And, and, you, and you don't end up with huge maverick risk by starting with an equal weighted basis, which makes you so exactly out right. of kilter with, there's so much um, uh, 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 tracking error or mm -hmm. frame of reference error with that. Um, I mean, you have to nod to big somehow, unless you're gonna really expect a lot of variation away from the celebrity indices. Right. And so you've avoided huge AUM outflows right? by doing that. Exactly. Because as you said, if you don't keep them in the market, if you believe in your investment proposition, you want to keep them invested, even if you're not pure, even if this isn't the purest form of your investment proposition. Yeah. Um, you know, it's as much as they're willing to stick with, you're helping mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, is there, oh, oh, I wanted to ask if we, if we have time, I see that you're getting into the ESG um, space, environmental, social, you can define it. Is that convictional or is that kind of driven by the fact that there are people who want to invest this way? I'm a libertarian. Um, I have friends who are hard left. Um, I have friends who are deeply concerned about the environment, deeply concerned about uh, weaponry, deeply concerned about um, uh, governance issues and so forth. And my attitude is simple. If you want your investments to align with your convictions, and if we can help you earn a better return consonant with that, wonderful. So there's a lot of ESG products. ESG is popular and it pushes prices higher. So most ESG products are priced at higher PE ratio, higher price to sales, higher price to book value than the market. You're paying a premium. Our ESG products are priced 40 to 50% cheaper than the market. Why wouldn't we offer that to folks who want to do that? It's, it's not, um, my objection to wokeism is, is not that um, I think people shouldn't have those opinions, it's that they shouldn't impose them on others. So in your view, is generic ESG oversold um, out there in the discussion as an alpha generator, as opposed to acknowledging what it is, which is a personal moral choice that you may pay a price for in terms of performance? Um, a dozen it's years like ago, it was called SRIs, um, socially responsible investing. Right. And back then, the people offering SRI products were saying, um, we think we can give you socially responsible investing with returns similar to the market. Maybe there'll be a haircut, but not much. And now it's marketed as by ESG, the companies that don't meet our screens, they're going, they're going way down. And uh, if you buy ESG, you're going to beat the market. I don't think so. 
they're now priced at a material premium to the market. I think they're going to be delivering inferior returns, not superior returns. And they overlap a lot with that whole fang zone that's already super in right? So um, well, a lot of lawyers are going to feast on <laughs> funds which promised ESG alpha additiveness. Rob Arnaz, anything else you want to add before? We've covered a lot of ground. This has been a lot of fun. It has. Thank you for very- uh, 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 inviting me to do this. You've been very generous with your time, and I look forward to seeing you at Freedom Fest um, in just a short while, uh, where we'll be on a, I'll be moderating a panel with you and Steve Moore. So, Rob Arnott, thanks for being with Perfect. us. Perfect. Thank you so much.